Kitos, thank you for having me. This past Tuesday, Americans re-elected Barack Obama as President of the United States of America. Throughout the election cycle, religion played an important role in how the candidates, parties, and political action groups differentiated themselves and built support for their parties. In the final days of the election, Vice Presidential Candidate Paul Ryan accused Obama of warring against what he called Judeo-Christian values and trumpeted his own credentials as a voice of conservative Christianity. His Democratic counterpart, Joe Biden, by contrast invoked what he called Catholic social doctrine as root cause for his support for liberal political positions. The contrast between these two positions is great, and it is not merely rhetoric. Religion serves a central role in the US presidential elections, particularly as a wedge issue used by candidates and their parties to distinguish themselves and their opponents. Now, we could trace the connection between religion, politics, and the US presidency back to the early republic, if we wish. Perhaps to George Washington and his famous letter to the American Jewish community, or the involvement of Protestant clergy in debates over federalism in the US Constitution, presidential power, and their limits. Certainly, we might focus on Abraham Lincoln, the fallen Christ figure of American political religion, whose speeches were sermons and whose visage literally watches over Washington, D.C. in the Greek-style monumental temple constructed for his veneration. The presidential campaign of Roman Catholic Al Smith in 1928 and the manner in which the vitriolic anti-Catholicism of 1920s and 1930s America hamstrung his campaign also offer relevance. Yet I argue the story of religion, politics, and the US president, presidential elections, in the contemporary times at least, is best rooted in the consideration of the campaign between John Fitzgerald Kennedy and Richard L. Nixon in 1960, a campaign, a campaign in which Kennedy's Catholicism and Nixon's Protestantism became key factors in how both campaigns designed and implemented their strategies and in how people on the ground voted. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, or JFK as he's popularly known, was the scion of a Boston-based political dynasty and was groomed for presidential ambitions from the start. His 1960 campaign became a pivotal moment in the relationship between religion, politics, and the presidency. Religious people opposed Kennedy on religious grounds. Religious people voted for Kennedy on religious grounds. Anti-Catholicism emerged as a key issue, both among conservatives opposing Catholicism as un-American and liberals opposed to Catholicism for what they saw as its undemocratic nature and in institutional life. Kennedy had to defend his religious identity as private and therefore irrelevant to his political and governmental duties, which he did in his famous September 12, 1960 speech to the Greater Houston Ministerial Association. The position he laid out in this speech came to dominate American political life, especially as seen from the left. I will excerpt it here. To quote Kennedy, I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute, where no Catholic prelate would tell the president, should he be Catholic, how to act, and no Protestant minister would tell his parishioners for whom to vote where no church or church school is granted any public funds or political preference. Whatever issue may come before me as president on birth control, divorce, censorship, gambling, or any other subject, I will make my decision in accordance with these, that is my views, in accordance with what my conscience tells me to be the national interest and without regard to outside religious pressures or dictates." Unquote. Now, Kennedy, of course, prevailed in the election, partially by drawing Catholic supporters from across the political divide, as well as amassing large Jewish support. As the historian Cardi Thomas has written, quote, by disproving the unwritten law that only a Protestant could win election to the presidency, Kennedy's achievement allowed Americans of every religion, race, and gender to maintain a genuine sense of his or her first-class citizenship and inclusion in American political culture, unquote. This is certainly the way the election was remembered. 
But in the history of the presidential race, Thomas found that both campaigns made savvy use of religion to demonize the opponent, increase voter turnout and participation among their own constituencies, and exploit various forms of religious resentment and identification. Both the Kennedy and Nixon campaigns were quite intentional in using religion in this way, Thomas rightfully contends. This laid the groundwork for the place of religion in US presidential politics today. Flash forward 20 years to the Reagan revolution, and we find the place of religion embedded into what historian James Davidson Hunter has called the culture wars. Of course, the rise of the religious right has many social and cultural reasons and precursors. But its formation as a sort of political religious fusion owes much of its potency to the backlash against liberalizing elements of political and social life. Notably, rising social acceptance of abortion, homosexuality, contraception, environmentalism, and the secularization of public schools. The religious right drew primarily from evangelical and fundamentalist Protestants, later from conservative Catholics, and became a major force in United States politics. Led by prominent evangelicals such as Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, and James Dobson, the religious right took institutional form as the moral majority, Christian coalition, and focus on the family, among other organizations, and became a major force in US politics. The religious right served a crucial role in defeating President Jimmy Carter and electing Ronald Reagan, an ironic fact given that Carter identified as a Southern evangelical and Reagan a religious moderate from California. As it's been often stated, Reagan could not win support from most Republicans today on religious grounds. Jay Brooks Flippin has written of this development as cementing the bond between religious conservatives, fiscal conservatives, and the Republican Party. To quote him, by the end of the decade of the 1980s, they had grown more partisan than ever, any pretension for bipartisanship now obviously a facade. The alliance between the Republican Party and the religious right was as firm as ever, unquote, writes Brooks. By the 1990s, evangelical Protestant had become somewhat synonymous with Republican, flipping contents. This, then, is the religious political background into which stepped Barack Obama when he ran for presidency in 2008. At the time, Obama was a member of Trinity Church in Chicago, a church associated with the United Church of Christ, a liberal religious body that is the inheritor of the Puritan churches of New England. Americans literally celebrate the Puritans as the founders of the nation. One might therefore expect Obama's membership and what is certainly the most mainline of all mainline Christian churches to be a non-issue. This was, of course, not the case. Critics have assailed Obama's religious identity in several ways. First, that he is part of an extreme black nationalist Christianity. Second, that he is not a real Christian. And third, that he is a closet Muslim. The so-called Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah Wright controversy of 2008 highlights the first case. The facts are probably quite well known here, but to briefly summarize, African American minister Jeremiah Wright was the pastor at the multiracial Trinity Church where the Obamas belonged. Wright followed a form of liberation theology that stressed racial and class equality and justice. And his sermons critiqued white racism, the history of the American government's mistreatment of its black and Native American citizens, and US foreign policy. Conservative critics assailed Wright as anti-white, anti-Semitic, and anti-American, and they accused Obama of sympathizing with Wright. Now Wright indeed assailed the American government for what he saw as sins ranging from racism to colonialism, and he certainly rejected the, uh, the strand of American exceptionalism generally held up and accepted in wide swaths of American culture. University of Chicago theologian Dwight Hopkins points out that one must understand African American Christianity with reference to its history, and that Wright speaks from a very specific theological position. True, Wright's actual theology is complex, but it is not really at issue here. Obama was criticized for being associated with a theology that critics assailed as un-American because it challenged popular assumptions of American exceptionalism and American moral superiority. This episode culminated in Obama severing his relationship with Trinity and having to publicly refute his former pastor. 
Now, secondly, Obama has been accused of not being a real Christian. In the most recent election cycle, former Pennsylvania Senator and failed Republican presidential candidate Rick Santorum accused Obama of possessing, quote, some phony theology. Oh, not a theology based on the Bible, a different theology, unquote. Here, Santorum invokes a much broader conservative Christian critique of liberal Christianity, namely that it is not real Christianity since it does not follow the same theology predicated on a very specific form of biblical interpretation, strict social teachings, and the prototypical born-again salvific experience. Sociologist Christian Smith has found this to be one of the major wedges between conservative and non-conservative, that is, mainline and liberal Christians. And this is true both in politics and broader culture. Thirdly, some critics have assailed Obama as not Christian at all, but in fact a closet Muslim. I did take this one on the right from a blog, so take it or leave it. During the 2008 campaign, several prominent conservative organizations and individuals made such claims. Most notably, talk radio host Michael Savage and the major Christian magazine Insight. More recently, country music musician Hank Williams made the same claim, declaring that Obama was a Muslim who, quote, hates farming, cowboys, and fishing, unquote. <laughs> Such accusations draw upon established facts, such as Obama's father's Muslim identity, or Obama's attendance at a madrasa during childhood in Indonesia, but ignore factual evidence to the contrary from recent history, and of course, President Obama's own statements to the contrary. They are, however, powerful symbolic and rhetoric means of seeking to differentiate Obama from his Republican challengers. Now, there are several ways to, inter uh, to interpret the various uh, accusations against Obama's religious identity and the way that religion has played a role in how Obama is portrayed by his conservative opponents. To me, it shows the way in which Christianity has come to mean a very specific type of Christianity rooted in theological and social conservative sensibilities that extol the ideals of American exceptionalism and, uh, and Christian hegemony. For many religious conservatives, evangelicals especially, mainline or liberal Christianity is not true Christianity because it does not share the same theology, or I should add, national outlook. For many evangelical Protestants, to be really Christian is to support free market economic policy and reject abortion, gay rights, and national health care. This approach to Christianity becomes fused with what it means to be an American as witnessed in the birther conspiracy theories, which claim Obama was born outside of the United States, and that all evidence to the contrary is ipso facto forged. This belief combines the idea of nationalism, religion, and conservative social politics. Republican Colorado Congressman Mike Kaufman encapsulated this approach when he claimed, quote, I don't know whether Barack Obama was born in the United States of America. I don't know that. But I do know this, that in his heart, he's not an American. He's just not an American." Unquote. Coleman's later explanation, excuse me, Kaufman's, Kaufman's later explanation and half-hearted apology for the statement make explicit the religious nationalistic connection. To quote him, and this quote is not up here, to quote him, I don't believe the president shares my belief in American exceptionalism. His policies reflect a philosophy that America is but one nation among many equals. I believe America is unique and based on a core set of principles that make it superior to other nations." Unquote. This illustrates the way in which Obama's identity has come to symbolize what one might call, to paraphrase theologian Paul Tillich, an ultimate concern. These sort of accusations against Obama reflect the deep-seated conservative Christian nationalism present within at least one subset of American culture. One wherein the type of religion one practices becomes fused with a set of related issues connected to where one stands on international relations and social issues. At least from this perspective, Obama does not support the right view of the nation state, nor does he support the right social positions. Logically, therefore, he cannot be a Christian, nor a true American. Religion becomes a powerful and divisive symbol of discourse.
Turning from Obama to Romney, one leaves behind uh, Protestant Christianity and must consider the faith of a man who belongs to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or Mormonism. One of the so-called upstart sects that set America ablaze in the 19th century and has become a major force in American religion and politics today. Mormons consider themselves Christian, and most historians, myself included, consider them a fourth strand of Christianity alongside Catholicism, Orthodoxy, and Protestantism. Yet many Christians disagree and reject Mormonism as not Christian. The most interesting issue about Mitt Romney's Mormonism is that it was a non-issue in the 2012 campaign. By this I mean that within evangelical Protestant dominated Republican Party, a political party that has effectively fused religious with political identity, the fact that Romney belongs to a religious movement that many evangelicals consider a non-Christian cult would ordinarily be expected to have garnered a great deal of attention. Yet it did not. Why? The answer lies in the same fusion of religion, nationalism, and social politics. For conservative Christians, primarily evangelical and Catholic, who make up the grassroots of the Republican Party, the same constellations of issues that make Obama not a real Christian, despite his membership in a mainline Christian body, also marks the non-Protestant Romney as sufficiently and appropriately Christian, despite the fact that many of them reject his theology as well. Franklin Graham, son of renowned evangelist Billy Graham, made this explicit with this statement, yes, made this explicit with this statement that he could not, he could not vote for a candidate who supports same-sex marriage and abortion, and therefore supported Mitt Romney, despite his view that Mormonism is not a true form of Christianity. Can an evangelical Christian vote for a Mormon? Asked Franklin Graham in a recent editorial published by the Billy Graham Evangelical Association. Quoting him, the answer is yes. Since Romney, that's the quote, since Romney supports the same moral and social positions as evangelicals. Graham cited Romney's family values and specifically his opposition to abortion, gay rights, and his support for Zionism as specific reasons he could vote for Romney. This reminds me a bit of the anecdote of the uh, a previous speaker mentioned of the, the, the Muslim and Christian clerics hugging each other in Egypt and thinking they're each is going to hell. Uh, again, we see the manner in which Romney's avowed support for conservative social causes and conservative foreign policy marks him as within the fold of conservative Christian America and therefore palatable to evangelicals despite his Mormonism. The LDS Church has quite intentionally attempted to establish good relationships with evangelicals on precisely these shared values, despite theological and practical disagreements. Speaking from a cultural perspective, Mormons have successfully marketed themselves as ideal Americans, known for their work ethics, one might say Protestant work ethics, to paraphrase Weber, suburban lifestyles, love of sports, family, outdoor recreation, there's the fishing, red meat, and support for the American Armed Forces. All this marks Romney as American, just as his social and international positions mark him as appropriately nationalistic and conservative. He is therefore Christian as well, at least Christian enough to vote for. Romney attempted to parlay this cultural conservatism into his advantage and solidify his Christian credentials during the final week of campaigning in a series of robotic telephone calls sent to prospective Virginia voters. His telephone calls begin by addressing, I'm going to excerpt this, uh, quote, Christians who are thinking about voting for Obama, unquote, and calling the president, quote, a real threat to our religious freedom, to our faith, our values, our freedom, unquote. Note the use of the word our here and the way in which Romney is us and Christian and Obama is them, that is, not Christian. This 11th hour campaign message is how Romney sought to parlay religion into electoral victory this past Tuesday. Now, the election is now over. And with the aid of exit polling, we can actually see how successfully the two candidates uh, used religion to their advantage. Exit polls show a clear pattern. 
Though state-by-state -state analysis is not available at the time of this writing, the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, a project of the Pew Research Center, has compiled and analyzed the national data on religion and the 2012 presidential election. This data is from Pew. I'm using the Economist version because it is easier to read. You'll see on the next slide. Unsurprisingly, Romney won the white evangelical vote by a substantial margin, 79% to 20%. Among non-evangelical Protestants, Romney won by still impressive 10 percentage points, 54% to 44%. Black Protestants supported Obama by a 90% uh, percentage point margin, 95% 95 to 5%, making overall support for Romney among all Protestants 57% to 42% or 15 percentage points. I'm trying to be very careful here because percentage points is different from percent. Comparing these numbers to the same group's voting patterns in 2008 and 2004, uh, which is not up here, show that Romney did the same or better than McCain and Bush in attracting the white evangelical and non-evangelical Protestant vote. So, so much for the claims of anti-Mormon sentiment preventing Protestants from voting for Romney. If my analysis is correct, such voters considered Romney Christian enough to vote for because of his membership in the constellation of social, religious, economic, and nationalistic Christian conservatism. Among Catholics, Obama and Romney split the vote. Yet Romney led Obama by 19 percentage points among white Catholics while Obama led by a 54 percentage points among Hispanic Catholics. In capturing 75% of the Hispanic Catholic vote, Obama did three percentage points better than he did uh, four years ago, uh, within the margin of error of this particular poll, and nine percentage points better than Kerry eight years earlier. Yet, I would hesitate to attribute this to religion. The vitriolic verbal attacks on immigrants by several leading Republicans probably did more uh, to, uh, to drive the Hispanic vote to Obama than anything Obama did in particular to attract the voters to him. The story of Jewish voting did not change much at all, with approximately seven in 10 of all Jewish Americans supporting Obama and the Democrats, as this religious group has done for the past several decades. Alignment of Jewish values with liberal principles and a response to the Christianization of the Republican Party explain this continued trend of Jewish support for Democrats. Now thus far we have considered breakdown by membership in different religious bodies. Turning to breakdown by attendance, this is from Pew, uh, turning to breakdown by attendance, we find that Obama won support from the majority of Americans who attend a house of worship less than weekly. Romney won 59% of the vote of those who attended weekly or more, a comparable number to Bush's success rate, and slightly higher than McCain's 55%. Among Protestants attending weekly, Romney captured a whopping 70% of the vote, compared to 57% of Catholics who attend weekly. Since slightly over 4 in 10 Americans report attending religious worship at least once a week, this is a sizable population. But as the numbers indicate, this group is disproportionately evangelical Protestant. Remember, Romney lost the election. Again, it does not appear that Romney's identity as a Mormon had much effect in how people voted. Some of the state-by-state -state data bucks the national trends. In Virginia, Obama won every category of voter. So this is national. In Virginia, he won every category of voter. Uh, uh, by three percentage points among those who attend weekly, by seven percentage points among those who attend occasionally, and by 32 percentage points among those voters who report never attending religious worship. Yet Romney captured 78% of the evangelical vote in Virginia, which indicates to me that non-evangelicals non in Virginia just attend church more often, a contention that is supported by sociological studies of religious attendance in the American South. What is interesting in the national pattern uh, is, is the less, I'm <clears throat> sorry, over again. What is interesting is the national pattern of less frequent attendees voting for Obama. 
Obama won 55% of those who attended a few times a month and 56% of those who attended a few times a year. 11 and 14 percentage point leads over Romney. Obama led by 28 percentage points among those who self-report never to attend religious worship, a category that includes atheists, individual spiritual practitioners, and secularized Christians. Now here's where it gets interesting. It's already interesting. Another recent poll pew, uh, a pew poll, uh, showed this category growing over the last decade, a fact which both parties will surely take note. Now these are early exit poll numbers, and in the coming weeks we'll know more. But they reveal several important facts. First, the religious divide in politics is quite real, but it is mitigated somewhat by the even stronger divides between other demographic, group, demographic groups, namely ethnicity and immigration status. In some demographic groups, religion clearly trumps the other demographic factors. Obama's 16 percentage point lead among the so-called millennial generation of 18 to 25 year olds seems remarkable. But when broken down by religion, one finds a nearly identical pattern to the non-millennials. In a poll taken just weeks before the election, 80% of evangelical millennials planned to vote for Romney, whereas Obama led by 17 percentage points among Catholic millennials, by 45% among religiously unaffiliated millennials, and by 46% among non-white Protestant millennials. Second, most Americans are religious and most Americans voted for Obama. So by definition, Obama was able to capture at least some portion of all such groups, even the evangelical vote, where he was weakest. Obama very successfully built a broad base of religious support, unlike Romney, who appealed primarily to white evangelicals and conservative Catholics. This is religious coalition supporting Obama on the left, religious coalition supporting Romney on the right, for those who are not reading English. The Pew Research Center's 2009 and 2012 studies indicate a growing religious diversity in the United States, which positions the Democrats well. Their 2009 survey reveals a remarkable religious diversity within America, one where an even self-defined Protestants held beliefs and practices drawn from various non-Christian religions, such as the use of psychics, yoga, and belief in reincarnation. The 2012 survey showed a similar pattern, as well as the, ri the rise of the religious nuns, that is, those who claim to practice no religion. To quote Pew's analysis, quote, in the last five years alone, the unaffiliated have increased from just over 15% to just under 20% of all U.S. adults. Their ranks now include more than 13 million self-described atheists and agnostics, nearly 6% of the U.S. public, as well as nearly 33 million people who say they have no particular religious affiliation, 14%. Those numbers dwarf the number of American Jews, American Muslims, American Hindus, American Buddhists, American Sikhs, this is precisely the group disproportionately voting for Barack Obama and the Democratic Party. Clearly, religion served a major role in how the parties and candidates differentiated themselves and how voters made their choices about who to support. Religion is, after all, a powerful symbol, rhetorical tool, and marker of individual and social identity. So what does the future hold? As we say, historians are bad prognosticators, but I think it is safe to say we will see more of the same. Religion is too powerful of a cultural and social force for politicians to leave it alone. I expect even more in the 2016 presidential election. Thank you, Kitos Tuck. <laughs>